Welcome. My name is Brian Guerrero. I am the newest member of the IPD staff. And with me here, we have uh, also Marlene Fong from the IPD staff. And we have our presenters, uh, Brendan Nieves and Ulises de la Chea, <laughs> who will be telling us about integrated and designated ELD at the secondary level. Uh, we've got, been running, the IPD department has been running a professional development series this week and last week on a number of topics. Attendance has been fantastic, so thank you all for spending your afternoon with us today. And Ulises and Brenda, thank you very much for putting this together for us and sharing it with your colleagues. Well, thank uh, you for having us. Absolutely. All right, can you go to the next slide, please? IPD department, uh, we've got a focus on rich content and effective pedagogy cultural, uh, culture engagement and socio-emotional learning, equity, equity access agency and advocacy and system support and improvement. Next one, please. And then just wanted to do a little uh, commercial for Prop 15, Schools and Communities First Initiative. Uh, it's about realigning the way property taxes are collected, making sure big corporations pay their fair share uh, and when it passes, it will bring uh, $12 billion each year into California schools, uh, making sure we, we have more of the resources that we all so badly need. So thank you. I'm going to stop my video for a few minutes. So uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, we have, I think this webinar is going to be great, and I hope you guys um, take some tips and strategies um, so you can take them back and use them. Um, in this new, new school year. Um, so our goals for this webinar would be the main one is the human element. Just knowing your students is extremely important to know our students and how are we going to be able to do that. We're going to be able to know them by staying connected with, with them. Um, we're also going to um, show you some tips, um, share with you some tips to adjust your lesson so we don't want you to create more work than what you have. Just adjust what you have um, so you can be ready for this new school year. And also we're going to talk about um, ways that we can provide um, constructive feedback to our students. Um, this is a crucial piece um, for students' success in distance learning. So the essential question that we want you guys to keep in mind and hopefully at the end of the presentation, you will be able to answer it, is how can we create opportunities and minimize barriers to ensure students will continue to develop um, their language skills in English in the distance learning uh, model? So um, one approach that I personally um, have been taking since the closures of schools back in March is a universal design for learning. And for the purpose of respecting your time, um, I'm not going to, we're not going to play the video, but um, it's there. So as soon as we're done with the presentation, you can just have access to the presentation and play the video. It has a lot of really good information, but let me tell you a little bit about what is UDL. And UDL is an approach to curriculum that minimizes barriers and maximizes learning for all students. So that includes our English language uh, learners. So, for, so in order for learning to take place, there are three broad networks in our brain that are involved in the process of learning. So we have, the first one is uh, recognition, the what of learning. And the second one is for skills and strategies, and that would be the how of learning. And then the last one is for caring and prioritizing the why of learning. So we can use the UDL principles to make learning accessible and flexible to um, all of our students, and that's what we need to do, especially right now in the times that we are um, teaching our students. Um, and you can see the principles right here. So is representation. And you, in this part of the learning process, you want to present content in multiple media, provide various support, 
activate background knowledge and also validate what they bring with them to the classroom, that knowledge that they already have, and support vocabulary for students to acquire um, you know, the knowledge that you want them to, or the, you know, the lesson that you want them to learn. Um, we also have the action and expression, and this is where you, um, we need to give plenty of options for students to express what they know, and we also have to provide um, models. So modeling is very important um, for students to understand what is expected from them, you know, to learn. And also we need to provide support and feedback. And the last one is engage, provide multiple means of engagement. And just think, think about this. Um, what fires one student will, won't fire another student. And also, if possible, you need to give um, choices that can build their self-confidence and autonomy. Autonomy is crucial right now because autonomy triggers intrinsic motivation. And right now, they have a lot of support, but at the same time, they're doing a lot of uh, work independently. So um, let me go to the next slide. So the idea and is Linda, that... Can you, can you turn the uh, closed captions back on? People are requesting that. Sorry. Oh, yes. OK. Um, they're done. Yes, they're on. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. So some of the ideas that, um, that we can focus on to create equal opportunities and minimize barriers for language development in distance learning, we came up with five. Um, and number one is focus on the human element. Two, we need to have um, clear communication with students, but also um, now it's even more important to have clear communication with parents as well. And um, also we need to provide choice and flexibility um, whenever it's possible. I know sometimes the curriculum might not allow that, um, but we can still be innovative and creative to provide the, that choice. Um, have attainable and relevant lessons. And Elisa is gonna talk about that, about that. And provide constructive feed, feedback, which is crucial for distance learning. So number one, you have to focus on the students. Um, we all know that communication with our students and parents is crucial, so um, it's important to build those um, strong relationships um, with the students and also build community within our virtual classrooms. Um, so we have to get them engaged, okay? Um, have, we have to have activities for building relationship and community. And sometimes we're like, well, I don't know what to do, but this could be a, a very simple activity that you can do, but it will pay off a lot. So for example, you can just create a Google form and just have a check-in question. Hey, how are you doing today? Is there anything that you wanna tell me? Okay, done. Um, or if you want to, you can go to this uh, website. It's called Mentimeter, and you can create a set of questions or just one question, and um, students answer the question in a one-word answer or a phrase, and then you can show their results in a, in a different format. It could be a graph. It could be a word cloud. Right now, the word cloud seems to be very attractive um, for students, okay? Another way that you can build relationships and community with um, students is ask them about their learning style. Do they know how they learn? Some of them, they don't even know. They're like, well, I'll just sit here and take notes. Well, maybe that might not be the, the best way that they learn. So you can actually provide a learning style quiz um, that they can take, and they are really interested in the results and I'm telling you this because I started school on Monday and that was my first activity and they were just so into it and they were like oh wow I didn't know that I learned um, by this way and in some and another student said oh this quiz doesn't lie it, re it read me well so you can get all these responses and also personality you can give them a personality assessment um, we know that during middle school and high school, um, that period, students are learning about themselves, they're learning about 
their friends who they are and who they are becoming. So I think these are great um, activities for them to, to do so they can know more about themselves and about their friends. And also you get to learn more about them. So if you notice some of the um, phrases are hyperlinked um, and they are underlined. So at the end of the presentation, you just click on it and it will take you to the links of those assessments. Um, here, if you don't share, um, then you are not gonna be able to build that community within your classroom because then students will not be able to find if there are similarities or differences among themselves. So one activity that I do is a thin slide presentation and I give, um, I also provided the link of an example. And basically it's just a, a slide deck and everybody gets to work on the same presentation. You assigned one slide per student, you give them a time limit, and then you tell them, okay, you have three minutes to paste a picture of the learnings of your learning style. And then they have to go and do it. And then after those three minutes or four minutes that you give them, then you say, okay, so you're gonna have 30 seconds to present to the whole class what your learning style is. I did it with my students on Tuesday and they really enjoyed it. And um, some of the students said, well, so-and-so, we, it seems that we learned you know, the same way. And the other one said, I'm glad that you did this because I don't have to show my face. Or, so this is a great way um, to just build relationships and communities. And remember, the underlying phrases are hy um, hyperlinked. The second one is communication is the key. Um, we have to be extremely um, clear. We have to talk with students. We have to meet with students. Um, and the instructor presence is a critical factor in the success of online learning. So be present. I know that most of the districts um, are required teachers to have li live sessions on certain days. So make sure you're there. Make sure that your students get to see you and get to, you know, get to hear or listen to what you have to say, because it does matter, it does matter, okay? Also, within that time, allow students to share. Um, this is my third day back in, in school. So today I said, okay, we have two minutes to um, share something that you haven't been able to share with your friends. And they started, they have a lot of things to say, so allow them to have that time. With parents, you have to be, um, you have to have great communication right now. And one way that you can do that is by having a Google Meet or a Zoom meeting kickoff with the parents and students, and then just tell them about about who you are and um, what your expectations are, and so on and so forth. So here, I provided a link to, like, a snapshot of my syllabus. It's a very concise syllabus, just highlighting the main points. Okay. And some of the um, apps that you can use to stay connected with parents, let them know um, how to access um, Google Classroom, invite them, students, um, let them know where you're gonna be posting your assignments, Google Classroom or Canvas. What are you gonna be using for live sessions? Or is it gonna be Google Meet or is it gonna be Zoom? Um, do you want students to email you? Do you want parents to email you? Um, if not, maybe you wanna use an app, <coughs> excuse me, that is called Remind, um, where you can actually text, and, and um, the, your text can be translated in, the, in different languages, and the parents will get their, that text without knowing your phone number. They can reply, and you will not know their phone number either. So it's a really cool um, app that you can use, and it's for free. And in the presentation, um, in the notes section, I added another one that is Talking Points. That is also um, another app that a lot of teachers are using. <clears throat> the third one, you have to be clear and uh, direct. So in this one, you have to have clear objectives, instructions for your um, lessons. They help you to just, the students will not, will know exactly what they need to do. They will not be stressed about, oh my gosh, what do I have to do? How do I do it? Where do I go? 
little things like that will stress the student to the point they'll be like, okay, you know what, I'm not gonna do it, I'll give up. So just have those clear um, objectives and instructions. And as we know, um, all the research that John Haiti, Haiti has done, is, um, it states that teacher clarity, anything above point, um, 50, point 0.75, you're gonna see a year worth of growth in learning. So it's, it's imperative to have those clear objectives and instructions. Um, something that is, gonna, that is gonna help you to create community as well is setting that online practices. Set your norms. What, you, um, what are your expectations? What are your office hours? Um, what are students expected to do when they are doing synchronous uh, sessions versus asynchronous sessions? Um, and something that I'm planning to do next uh, week is the social contract. So it's hyperlinked. So once you get the um, presentation, you can look at the example. But basically, you bring the students together and say, we are going to create a social contract. We're going to create our norms together. But you have to let them know that they are norms that are non-negotiable. They're, they're norms that you are going to put in place. and that's the way it is. And by allowing them to help you create that social contract, it's going to hold them accountable. Because if they break a norm or a rule, whatever you want to call it, then you can go back to that social contract and say, hey, you were part of this. And you told me that one of the, uh, one of the norms should be to respect, to be um, respectful when another classmate is talking and now you're not. So you can hold them accountable. And they, and they can hold each other accountable as well by you allowing them to <clears throat> be part of that um, creation of the sort of social contract. Another part that is extremely important is when we are planning, make sure that we plan with empathy. We don't know what students went through since March all the way to August. We don't know what they're going through right? So keep that in mind. Always plan with empathy and also teach with grace. You have to. We, we just have to do it because not just them, but us teachers, we have gone through a lot as well, okay? I have a couple questions here. This is just for your own reflection. How do you involve students in um, co-creating personal goals or the social con contract? And if you are, if you are, um, you, Involving students in creating personal goals um, that make sure that they relate to the objectives that you have. So just think about what ideas you have about that. <clears throat> and then provide choice and flexibility. Um, less is more. Sometimes we think that we have to do the same amount um, that we were doing um, if, when we were back in March in the classroom, but actually we just can't do it. So if you do less, um, it's gonna be more, meaning that students are gonna be more productive. You're not gonna get frustrated because students are not turning assignments or they're not showing up for live sessions. So just think about that. Um, whatever assignments, if you have five assignments that you wanna give them throughout the week, maybe it's not a good idea. Maybe cut it to three or maybe even cut it to two. Okay, uh, present in a variety of forms. Um, I provided here a choice board. Um, you may want to go with that option if possible, um, or you can do a hyper doc document. Um, but if you provide, uh, you know, choice to students, students are more willing to work, and it might be a little bit of extra work for you on your end but it pays off. And um, when, you, when we say provide choice, it doesn't mean that you have to provide five, six, six choices. You can just provide two choices. Hey, option A or option B, and they will be happy. They will be happy because they get to choose what to do um, in, in the sense of how am I gonna be able to express to my teacher what I have learned about the lesson, okay? And just, um, change it up, the, be in tune with the learning styles. Um, the kids don't learn the same, you know. Some of them, they, they are more kinesthetic. 
other ones are more, you know, um, quieter, calm. So just think about the learning styles. Maybe others are very visual. I think most of us are visual. Um, the other ones are auditive. So just keep in mind those um, learning styles. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to Ulises because Ulises has great tips um, as far as to just how to adjust your lessons to be more relevant and attainable. Thank you, Brenda. Hello, I'm Ulises Techa. Once again, thank you for joining us today. How many of you have ever felt ready, like really ready for the first day of school? I know that in my 15 years of teaching, I never had that feeling. And this year is no different. But you had all summer to plan, joke, right? And just because we had a stint of distance learning in the spring, all of a sudden we're supposed to be experts. I know, and you should know that I'm not an expert, but I did pick up a few things in the spring and during summer school that might be of, you, of use for you this year. And I also know because we're professionals and most importantly, because we care deeply for our ELD students that we're going to do the best we can to meet their needs. First, let's talk about you and a few things that might help you get through distance learning. Let's begin by taking a deep breath. And tell yourself, you got this. It's important for you to take care of yourself so you can be the best version of you for your students during this time. Something else to consider to help with distance learning is collaboration or teamwork. More than ever, the collaboration with your colleagues is going to be key for a successful year. I know that under the circumstances, it may be difficult to meet in person, but don't let that stop you from working as a team. Let me share a quick example. During summer school, a colleague attended a few of my Google Meets and she gave me invaluable feedback. So I adjusted my protocols for when students log into my meets and we figured out different ways of using the chat to make meets more interactive. If you have an opportunity to join a colleague's virtual classroom or the other way around, I highly recommend it. The next tip is going into your toolbox. Use the resources and strategies you already know. This is a time to apply your skills and use talents to bring students together and to provide lessons that are engaging and relevant to them. I will be spending most of my pr presentation on this topic in a few minutes. But before we move on, we'll finish the slide with a third tip, which is thinking outside the box. Don't be afraid to try something new. And I realize that a lot of what's going on is already new. An easy way of trying something new is to copy or steal. I've been doing a lot of that lately from educators on social media. I'm not big on social media, and honestly, I really don't know how to use it but I, I do use it to copy ed stuff from others. For example, since the school closure, one of my favorite people to follow on Twitter is Amanda Sandoval. Her stuff is amazing. She has no idea who I am, but I know who she is because she has really good stuff. There are a lot of generous educators out there sharing their stuff. I recommend tapping into the social media world for ideas and resources. Like I mentioned already, like I mentioned already, um, my presentation will cover using resources that you should already have in your toolbox. Back in March, many of us were struggling, or more likely we were freaking out trying to figure out what we were going to teach. I soon realized that I needed to do what I usually do when I'm developing a lesson, which is, is, which is to use the ELD standards. In my opinion, in a time like this, or really any time, the ELD standards is one of the biggest guides. I refer to them often, especially because they are easy to use. They correspond to the ELA standards, which helps prepare my ELD students for their rigor in their ELA class, and there are only 19 of them. I will share more about how these standards apply to the activities or lessons in a bit. An important tool with regards to ELD is also knowing the outpack test types. Becoming familiar with how students are tested allows you to give them practice. Let's think about integrated ELD for a moment. 
Through math or science curriculum, students are asked to present and discuss information from a word problem or chart or graph. This is actually a task students must perform on the OutPack test. Brenda, go ahead and click, please. The idea here is for you to use the content you're already teaching to present test-like scenarios to students to give them extra practice and to provide some scaffolds in order for them to be successful. For example, a simple tip for students to implement on this task type is to recycle the question. Go ahead and click. This is the last tip I'll share before showing some examples of how I put these tools into practice. The last tip is knowing your students. Knowing your students is key for adjusting your lessons to make them attainable and relevant. Starting the school year with distance learning will make this a challenge, so I encourage you to try some of the great ideas Brenda shared on building relationships and community with your students. In this part, I'm going to focus more on knowing where your students are academically and also using their interest. Let's talk about their interest first. We all know that a good hook sparks the student's attention and will use and usually will keep them engaged for the rest of the lesson. A lot of times a good hook could be an image or a video, a topic, something they're into. For example, in my community, if I use a picture of a soccer ball, right away students will have tons to talk about. Five years ago, if I used an image of a skateboard or a skate park, I would have gotten very little interest. But now, that has changed. You see, our community added a skate park about three years ago, and now skateboarding is of high interest to a lot of my students. One last example, and I'll stick to the sports theme here, is cricket. Many of my students from India and Pakistan enjoy watching cricket and playing cricket. Therefore, I make it a point to bring cricket into some of my lessons. For me, knowing the community I work in and knowing my students' interests has paid off when building relationships and bringing them into lessons. In order to make lessons more attainable for students, it helps to meet them where they're at. We are all familiar with a summer learning loss. Well, we can probably expect that and then some this new school year. In Live Oak, our secondary the ELD team will be administering a pre-assessment. One of the assessors will be using the English 3D reading inventory. We plan to give this test during a Google Meet and our goal is to complete it in one sitting or class period. During the meet, students will be asked to keep their mics muted and cameras on while they take the test. They will log into their HMH Central account and proceed with the test. We also created our own pre-assessment to get a glimpse of their listening, speaking, and writing skills. We will push this pre-assessment in a Google form through Google Classroom, the listening section of an audio segment from ListenWise, which is linked on the form, is what we will use for, the, for a listening assessment. For the speaking portion of the test, students will share their response on Flipgrid. We will follow the same protocol as in the 3D reading inventory of mics off but cameras on while they take the test. Now I would like to share some examples of activities or lessons that worked well during distance learning. This, this first activity is simple but powerful as it does create opportunities for students to have meaningful interactions. The activity is conducted using the stream page in Google Classroom. I use a stream Monday through Friday and usually post an announcement by 8 in the morning. Many times I create the announcement the day before and schedule it to post at 8. My announcements vary. They could be a quick hello, a reminder, or something for them to prepare before we meet virtually. The activity I'm sharing with you today was influenced by the death of George Floyd and the protests that occurred short after. In my stream on June 1st, I wrote a paragraph long post about what students might have been seeing on TV. I ended the post by telling my students that we could talk about this issue in our Google Meet and to use a stream to post comments or questions they had. 
I would like to emphasize at this point, that at this point in the year, I knew my students well, and I knew that they would want to discuss this matter. They trusted me, and they knew it was a safe place to share how they were feeling. Some students chose to post comments on the stream, and others shared something in the Google Meet. But I, also, but I also had students not say much. With that said, during that virtual meeting, we were all present in the conversation. Even the ones that did not speak up, they still chimed in with a, yeah, or that's not fair, on the chat. I would like to conclude this slide with one of my students' comments on the stream. The student wrote, Imagine there's two, imagine there's two eggs, a white solid egg, and the other one is darker. When you crack them, they have the same yolk and albumin in every single egg you find. What I'm trying to say is that people are all the same, but the only thing that is different is the color. Black Lives Matter. I thought this was a remarkable post. This activity meets the Yaldi standards 2 and 11 in part one of interacting in meaningful ways. Here's an example of a listening activity. Our secondary team mainly uses ListenWise for most of our listening practice, but we also use ReadWorks because they have a read aloud feature for a lot of their content. ListenWise has a lot of current events and topics of high interest for students. We we'll use it to launch a unit or to bring in another medium in a lesson. And we sometimes use it as a standalone activity. Most segments in ListenWise are two to five minutes long. Because the segments are not too long, we are able to use it with all of our students, including beginners. The weird news segments are great for beginners because they're only about 30 seconds long. The one I'm showing here is only 26 seconds, but it is packed with academic and precise language. In summer school, this was part of a verbs lesson. During our synchronous time, we reviewed verbs and the use of precise verbs. Then we gave students a purpose for listening. We asked them to listen for verbs or actions that their rats performed in the audio. The students identified the verbs and we discussed them as a class. I remember there were words like navigate, drive, and maneuver. Asynchronously, the students listened again and then answered the questions on the ListenWise platform. Moving on to a reading activity. This lesson is part of a unit. Our team tries to develop thematic units. We believe that ELD students are more successful expressing themselves orally or in writing when they spend longer time working on a given topic or theme. This activity starts synchronously with the first read. I read the article to the students, but you can have students volunteer uh, to read depending on their level. Then we, then we discuss the main idea before moving on to the second read. For the second read, students had a purpose for reading. In this case, I'm asking students to highlight evidence stating why bench watching is harmless and evidence of why bench watching is hurtful. During the lesson, I modeled looking for evidence. Then I asked students to share an example of evidence they found. Asynchronously, asynchronously students will continue highlighting evidence and answer the reading comprehension questions and the Newzella site. There are two things I would like to mention before I move on. First, our team is using Pear Deck to, de to deliver lessons. We love the interactive features and student pace mode feature. When we're meeting with our students, synchronously we turn the student pace mode off, and this helps them stay on track or at least on the same slide with you. We then turn it off for asynchronous learning. We're also looking forward to using more of the immersive reader tool in the Pear Deck, as we feel this feature will help with slides we prepared for our beginners or newcomers. The second item in the green box you see, uh, the second item is the green box you see on the left. This is a link to a Screencastify video. The video here is a short tutorial on how to highlight and comment in the new ZLA platform. The last day of summer school, I served with my students and I learned that one of the things they found the most helpful was the help videos. I highly recommend you consider making some tutorials for the technology you anticipate some of your students will be struggling with. 
A speaking activity is the last example I'll be sharing with you. This activity addresses standards 9 and 11 in part one of the ELD standards, and it's also an outpack task. Like I mentioned before, we like to develop lessons around a theme. This is a graph on the amount of time people spend watching different types of media. As a synchronous activity, we first discussed the graph and the different data points. To make sure the students understood the graph, I might ask questions about the graph and have students respond in the chat, then call on students to elaborate their response. I would also post a question that allows them to practice recycling the question. For the asynchronous portion of this lesson, students recorded their responses in Flipgrid. You could also assign students to listen to one or two other peers and give them feedback based on the rubric you assign. For the rubric, we, or I should say my partner, she created a rubric that mirrored the LPAC rubric. Here's a response from a student that has been in the country for two years. I started my presentation by giving you three tips for distance learning. To summarize, the first tip is to take care of yourself and collaborate. Tip two was to use what you know, like the standards, to help you adjust lessons for, <coughs> for distance learning. And the last tip is to try new things or to think outside the box. As you notice in the activities I shared, I use different platforms to try to engage my students and to meet their needs. Some of these programs I was already using before March but because of the pandemic, I had to dive into new ones. I mentioned already that I'm not a regular user of social media, but without social media this last few months, I think I would have been lost. The programs you see here are just a few of what's out there. I do recommend trying one at a time, and if it works for you and you're able to get it, then use it. I wish I could take back the two weeks right after the school closure. I spend an endless amount of time looking for resources and trying new platforms. Ultimately, I went with what I already knew, and I only really activated a few new programs. Your time will be better spent developing or adjusting your lessons than trying to figure out which program is best. Brenda and I had three goals for this presentation. She covered the first goal, which was staying connected with your students. I covered the second goal by giving you some tips to adjust your lessons. And our third goal is to give you some ways to provide feedback to your students. I do want to start by saying that if I could think of one positive point during distance learning, it was providing feedback to my students. I felt that I was, able, I was able to look at my students' work a little closer and provide more consistent feedback during this time. I also believe that my students, mainly for those who completed the assignments, were able to continue growing because they were responsive to the feedback. Most of the feedback was given in Google Classroom with CAMI or through one-on-one -on -one or small group virtual meets. I just had to share this example with you because it made me laugh when I first read it. This is a 3D worksheet that I assigned along with a writing assignment to help remind students to use transition words. I used CAMI and Google Classroom to push out the assignment. As you can see, I gave the student his score and make, made a quick comment. I wrote, great job, sigele, which means keep it up. His response to me was, too much work. Again, this is just a simple way to let him know that I was checking his work, and in return, it was a way for him to let me know that he was, how he was feeling and that he was also checking his work. In this next example, I'm also using Google Classroom. This doc is a shaping sheet and was pushed out as an assignment. We usually assign a shaping sheet to help students develop their paragraphs or first draft. First, I provided some writing suggestions to the, students, to the student on the doc. Then I use a comment box to give the student feedback. I write, Marta, you're awesome. You are ready to move on. Look over my suggestions and apply them to your final draft. That's all I have for you today. Now Brenda will continue to share other ways uh, you can provide feedback to your students. Perfect. Thank you so much, Ulysses, for those tips.
So um, speaking of feedback, I think um, I'm just going to use uh, Ulisa's example on how he used um, Google Classroom and um, or the Google Documents to provide um, his feedback in the comment uh, box. Um, you can actually, let me show you, I, I found something really cool. You can actually give feedback um, through your voice. You don't have to type and the students don't have to read it. They can actually listen to your, to your um, constructive feedback. And how do, you, how do you do that? Well, you have to download the extension mode. It's a, it's a Chromebook, a Chromebook, Chrome extension and it's free. So you download it. Um, I included a tutorial how to use it, but it's extremely simple. And once you download the, the extension, you're gonna have this little symbol um, in your comment box for your Google documents, for your Google Classroom. Um, and uh, give me one second. And not only that, you can actually um, use the use the mode extension to um, provide feedback in other languages. So, for example, you provide your feedback in English. It will transcribe it in English, and then the student will listen to your feedback in English. But maybe you want to provide your feedback in English and then transcribe it in Spanish because you have a newcomer day two or week one or week two, and you want to provide some feedback. So, um, Mode can actually translate, transcribe your your um, feedback in Spanish and the student can actually listen to it in Spanish or in this case Ulises I believe he has students that speak Punjabi then um, that is uh, an, a language that is available so I provided that tutorial for Moat how to use it very simple and I also provided an example of um, how I, I used it for the purpose of this um, webinar it is really it, it works really well it's really nice and it's very easy to use you might have a question well what about the students what about on their end um, students have to download that extension so they can actually um, listen to your feedback they just have to click on the little icon however if they don't download the extension can they still listen to your feedback Absolutely, yes. So what happens if a student doesn't download the, the extension? When they click on the little icon to, to um, listen to the feedback, it will take them to the mode um, web page, and then they can listen. It will automatically play your feedback. So either way, students will be able to um, get the feedback. And if you, are, if you require your students to download the extension, and you do um, peer feedback, then in the Google document or Google Classroom, um, they can you know they can provide their own feedback using this uh, extension as well. So it is a really neat extension. Check it out. Um, as soon as we get the the presentation deck, go ahead and just play around with the hyperlinks and get get started. Okay. Um, and then for today, so today you learn different ways to interact and engage um, students during distance learning. And our hope is that you will take one of these tools, or all of them, to create opportunities and minimize some of the barriers um, some students can continue, so students can continue to develop their language during this unprecedented time. As a follow-up, um, we would like you guys to reflect upon the following. So what are some of the barriers that prevent um, your students from being successful in distance learning? What can you do to minimize those barriers? So because, let's be honest, there are barriers out there. We just need to come up with 
solutions. What are we going to do to help them out? And if you have any questions, Elisa and I will be more than happy to answer them. Um, and that's all we have for you guys. Thank you both very much. And thank you all of the attendees today. There are, Brenda and Elisa, two questions in the q and I I don't know if you can see those down at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Um, one, do you want me to read them to you or can you see them? I, I see that there are two questions, but I, I won't open for me okay. too. Um, do you know, have any recommendations for apps that translate uh, for somebody who is trying to reach out to students in a language, either a language they don't speak or translating materials they find? Um, I know that there is an app, um, I forgot the name of the extension, but I can look it up for you and I can, I can get back to you within hours, but there is an app, not an app, but there's an extension that actually you can download and you can use it with materials, um, especially with Google slide presentations, they it will translate um, the, the content. I'm not sure I've heard really good comments, but I have not tried it, but I can get back to you with the name. Okay. Thank you. And mm -hmm. somebody asked about closed captioning in Zoom. I'm not aware of any closed captioning in Zoom, but the closed captioning you're seeing on the screen today is through Google Slides. So Google Slides in presentation mode does have a, a closed caption option. Um, second question. Do you have any recommendations? Um, is someone says they were assigned instructional assistance in a dual language uh, science class, ELD class. Um, have you worked with instructional aids or other types of assistance before? And what do you find to be good ways to utilize their support? Do you want to answer that, Ulises? Your mic's off. With distance learning, um, the way that I use the A's is really to, to connect with the students. So if I'm in the meet and, and the students aren't connecting, then it's a time for them to call home and make sure the students are connecting. Um, so that my uh, assistant, that's what they were, that's what the A's were doing for us um, mainly. But you can set them up with, with small groups. Um, um Personally, I don't have any aids right now, but I am working with a teacher that she does, but this is a history um, class. And we're just waiting on admin to say, yes, you, um, you can have like a, a very short breakout, um, breakout rooms for a very short time. And that's how you can utilize your um, paraprofessional aids. Um, they can review um, one way that you can, oh, they can help you is by front loading students with their vocabulary words that they are going to be introduced for the first time in the lesson. So your aides can help those students that need that exposure prior to the lesson. That's one way. Um, another way is um, if you're reading textbook, it's time to read then um, you can have them go over the text um, or the article, whatever you're reading, prior to the lesson. Um, so students don't feel lost when it's time to go over the lesson. Um, just checking questions. Somebody asked for the link, so I posted the link in the chat again. Um, does anyone, and this could be either Brenda or Ulises or maybe even anybody who's uh, in the audience still, does anyone know if there is a Spanish version of the online resource Creating America, a History of the United States, beginning through oh. World War One? I. I don't know if that's are, common. Are, are these videos? Are, are they talking about the videos? It doesn't say. Okay. Um, videos, no. I, I use, I'm, sure. uh, yeah. I'm sorry, what was that? Yeah, uh, the person just added that it's a textbook. Oh, a textbook, okay. Uh, for history, I taught US history for eighth grade, middle school, um, five years in, in our textbooks, they were in Spanish. Um, we didn't have practice books. 
and because the district did not order them. But yes, there uh, there are textbooks um, in Spanish for U.S. history. Most California books should have a Spanish version. Exactly. Yes, it's just a matter of um, talking. Yeah, you talk to your district, whoever's in charge of the curriculum. They should be able to find some textbooks in Spanish for U.S. history or history in general. Yeah. Um, do you, we've got a couple minutes left. There were a couple of links that we were kind of nervous about clicking during the presentation. Do you yeah. want to go back and see at this point? And for audience members, we weren't sure if that was going to kick it out of presentation mode if she linked to some of the, the links. But you had like a, a norms guide, I think. Okay, um, so let me stop the share. Is that what I do? Stop share? Sure. Okay. Okay, so I don't know where my presentation went. Okay, there it is. Okay. Let me get a question about the uh, history book. Uh, Leonard Delgado said uh, he looked it up and it, it does exist. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, okay, perfect. Uh, the norms. Um, norms. Okay. Um, like I said, uh, oh, well, this is the, um, this is an example of a social contract. I don't know if that was what you wanted me to say, but, um, when you create your norms, um, we don't say, okay, we're going to create our, so our norms, um, it's our social contract. So you, sure you ask, Am I sharing? No, I'm not sharing. Yeah, right, now, right now we're just seeing the people screens. So hit the green button at the bottom to share a screen again. I am so sorry. Oh, good. Okay. There you go. Do you see it? Okay, perfect. Um, so you just start with a blank chart of paper, nothing on it, and you say, okay, so today we are going to go ahead and create our social contract. You need to tell me what are some of the norms and rules that we should have that we know we are going to abide um, when we are in class? So students start, you give them time, you know, to think about what they want in their social contract. And then they start as, you know, throwing, you know, saying what they want. And then you start writing them. So respectful, be kind, be helpful, be um, trustworthy. Uh, the golden rule means you treat people the way that you would be, you know, you would like to be treated honesty, so on and so forth. Um, you don't put numbers because numbers means that they say, oh, number one is, you know, is very important versus number 15. I don't have to respect number 15. So you don't put numbers for that reason because all the rules are the same. Um, and then if you notice there are little check marks here, that means that that, that word, that adjective was repeated multiple times. So that's why instead of rewriting it, you just put check marks. Once the, the social contract is signed, I'm sorry, it's created, then you ask students, okay, so you are okay with this social contract, right? And you're going you're gonna to follow these norms because you are the one that came up with this. And they're like, yes. I said, okay, so I need your signature. Just, it's a contract, right? If I want to buy a house, as soon as I sign a contract, that means that I'm going to be responsible with my payments and all that. So they sign it. That gives them ownership that gives them accountability and if they break a norm someone was not respectful when a classmate was sharing their answer then you can call on that person and say hey you know what we're noticing that you're not um you're not being respectful so in order to make that up then that student has to give an affirmation so if i was talking and you were disrespectful then you need to give me an affirmation so we are okay. Like, I'm sorry, Brenda, I didn't mean to be disrespectful. And by the way, you know, I really liked um, how you came in, into the class and you smiled or you said good morning. So not only you're just holding them accountable, but you're creating that community in your classroom. Brenda, do you find when you're working with English learners that there are particular concerns uh, that students who, who are newer to the language have? Yeah, so I forgot to tell you. I'm so sorry. So you can have your social contract in the target language, okay? 
um, newcomers, you know, they're new not only to the school, but they're new to the school system in the United States. So you have to, you know, take baby steps with them and make them feel comfortable. If a student, when you are telling them, okay, you're going to sign the contract, if a student does not feel comfortable by signing it, you don't force him or her. You said, okay, you know what, let's try tomorrow. But I just want to let you know that even though you haven't signed yet, you still have to be respectful and you still have to be kind, you know, kind. Um, and then here in your social contract, you want to put the rules that are non-negotiable because they're just rules that you're going to have no matter what. So. Excellent. Thank you. There was also, I, I'm sorry, Ulysses, do you have anything you wanted to share on this? No, I'm, I'm, we use something similar in, in live book or actually the same thing, but no, she, she touched stuff on there was also, Brenda, you made a reference er, er, early on about kind of a record keeping tool you use. And that was another link that you. Um, it's for connecting, building relationships with students. So um, this one's um, Pull Everywhere um, and Mentimeter. I use, I use Mentimeter a lot for, for example, this week. Um, their warm-up was to go in into the live session while we were waiting for everybody to go online. I play a little bit of music and I display um, this one. So, um, okay, I'll put it, I'll put it up. But um, let me move it here. Let me show you. I don't know why. I'll add it. I don't know if I deleted it but I'll show you what it looks like. You can still see my screen, right? Yep. Okay, so I teach Spanish. This was Spanish one, introduction to Spanish. So when they came in today, this is what they saw. So um, when you, it's for free, but there, it has a lot of features, but you know, you only get a certain amount of features with the free membership, which are plenty. Um, so far right now, I'm using the cloud um, option. And what they do is when the students come in, um, you, present, you present your question. You can have more than one question. Which, what is your favorite snack? That was today's question. So students know that they have to go to www.menti.com, and then this would be the code. So if you were to go right now to that, you would be able to type your answer, and then we would see the word cloud of favorite snacks. Very easy to, to use and students seem to, to like it. Okay. Like Cheetos, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Flaming <Blaming hot. laughs> hot. Exactly, Baggies, yeah. <laughs> um, um, these are, you, you always want to start with a low level question just for the effective filter so you know they're not so nervous to share so something simple and then you know second week third week then that's when you can start asking questions that is you know that are related to your content before it requires more you know um, thinking and by that time they should be able to they should be willing to share fantastic well, thank you again very much. We, we very much appreciate you uh, spending this hour with us and sharing your experiences and, and you know, great ideas with us. Thank you again to all the attendees for joining us. Um, if you go to the CTA IPD website, um, there are still a couple more webinars this week. Um, for those of you who've already started back to the classroom, Brenda, it sounded like you were. Ulysses, have you started also? Mm -hmm. Yeah, today was my first day. Thank you very much. You look very yeah. good. <laughs> you survived. <laughs> but good luck to everybody, uh, you know, and continue to stay involved in, in CTA and your locals. Thank you all very much. Anything else? No, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.